Good afternoon. I'm Danielle Knapp, Nakash Curator at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the University of Oregon. And we're so glad that you're tuning in today for our special presentation on the representation of figure and landscape in Puerto Rico in the work of Myrna Baez and Norma Vila Rivero, which supports the JSMA's current exhibition of these artists' works, curated by Cheryl Hardup, and um, to support academic engagement with the UO's Latinx scholars, academic residential community, and many other UO colleagues and students. Please note that this exhibition's last on view dates for the general audience um, visits will be on Sunday, December 19th, due to um, changes in the university's holiday schedule. Our university is located on Kalapuya Alihi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians of Oregon and continue to make important contributions in their communities at UO and across the land we now refer to as Oregon. We also express our respect for all federally recognized tribal nations of Oregon and all other displaced indigenous peoples who call Oregon home. Today, our special guests are joining us from Puerto Rico. I wish to thank Michael Pawanda and Elizabeth Moyer, whose support has made today's program possible, and my JSMA colleagues who've assisted with the exhibition and today's Zoom event. During the program, we invite our student attendees to ask questions for our speakers in the Q&A box, um, which our speakers will address towards the end of the program. And we'd like to start with the student questions and then also invite general audience questions um, at that time as well. So now I'm very pleased to introduce Cheryl Hardup, currently the new director of the Museo de Arte de Ponce, um, but whom I think many in our audience know best for her five years as the GSMA's curator of Latin American and Caribbean art and academic programs. And we're so thankful to have this opportunity today to hear from her and from Norma and from Desi Martinez. So hello to all, and I will share um, images so that Cheryl can get started with more introductions. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Greetings from Ponce, Puerto Rico. Um, thank you, Danielle, for your wonderful introduction. Um, I've had the great fortune of working with you over the last five and a half years, and I really appreciate everything you've done to connect Tiempo Suspendido with students, faculty, and and the public. Um, I'm also grateful to Paul Nordquist for his technical expertise and, and his assistance with the JSMA's virtual public programs. And I'd like to thank two uh, very special people at University of Oregon who linked this exhibition and public program to the curriculum of uh, UO's Latinx Scholars Academic Residential Community, and they are Audrey Lucero, Associate Professor in the Department of Education Studies, Director of the Critical and Sociocultural Studies Program, and Director of the Latinx Studies Program, and my friend and colleague, Feather Crawford, who's the Program Coordinator for the Latinx Scholars Arc. Um, thank you, first year UO students who are joining us today for your interest in the work and Norma Vila Rivero and for your participation in the question and answer period. My deepest gratitude goes to our two speakers, two extraordinary women, Desi Martinez and Norma Vila Rivero. Before I introduce Desi, our first speaker, I'd like to say a few words about the Tiempo Suspendido exhibition. The project came about because the Jorn Schnitzer Museum of Art received a very generous gift of 10 silk screen and wood block prints from the estate of Myrna Baez in 2019, a year after her death. And I wanna thank four women who were responsible for the donation, Margarita Fernandez Zavala, Teresa Brigante, Desi Martinez, and Ma Dukella. And these women are artists, art historians, museum professionals, educators, gallerists, and people who have dedicated their lives to supporting Puerto Rican arts and culture. I had the honor of spending time with Myrna Baez and her work when I lived in Puerto Rico from 2005 to 2012. 
and I enthusiastically welcomed her prints into the JSMA's collection. During the COVID-19 pandemic, I started planning a small exhibition to spotlight the new acquisitions. At first, I wanted to focus on the visual and textual call and response I saw between Myrna Baez's imagery and the novels of her close friend and writer, Rosario Ferre. Both women expressed pride in the specific beauty of the island of Puerto Rico and acknowledged that the landscape always carries the weight of colonial history, racial and class conflict, and patriarchal traditions. When a larger gallery at the museum became available for the exhibition, it gave me the opportunity to shift gears and present a selection of Baez's prints with a new body of work by Norma Vila Rivero and to focus on the relationship between figure and landscape in Puerto Rico. Baez once stated, quote, I'm using landscape because I'm interested in form, in color, in place. Our landscape interests me because they're destroying it. I'm interested in those things that are Puerto Rican. I'm interested in expressing light, that which surrounds us, the shapes that have formed me, that have made me, and that moved me, end quote. Baez's seductive imagery urges the viewer to defend and care for that which is being destroyed. The shoreline, rainforest ecosystems, and public access to mountains. Norma Vila Rivero's work states explicitly what is implied in Baez's imagery. And the global crisis we are experiencing demands this vision from a younger generation. Vila Rivera Rivero updates us in the stark reality of destruction and the daily threat of disappearing people, culture, landmarks, knowledge, and nature. Lastly, the title Tiempo Suspendido or Suspended Time relates to losing a sense of time during the pandemic. It also refers to Puerto Rico's unresolved political status and the psyche of Puerto Ricans on the island and the majority of Puerto Ricans who live on the mainland, who travel back and forth, either physically or in their dreams. It's my honor now to introduce Desi Martinez, who will share with us the brilliance of Myrna Baez and her work Desi was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and she's an artist and former professor of woodcut printmaking and art appreciation. She received a BA in humanities and an MA in Puerto Rican studies. She attended the graphic workshop of the School of Architecture at the University of Puerto Rico and studied with artist Jose Antonio Torres Martino, a dear friend of Myrna Baez. Desi has extensive experience as a registrar and researcher two roles essential to strengthening Puerto Rico's history of art. She worked on the International San Juan Print Biennial in the 1980s and the Puerto Rico um, Arte Identidad, uh, excuse me, publication and documentary in the 1990s. Um, this is still a classic text for the history of art in Puerto Rico. And the book is available at University of Oregon's Knight Library. Desi assisted Myrna Baez on making some of her prints and she inventoried all the art and objects in Myrna Baez's collection. Welcome, Desi. Thank you, Cheryl. Good afternoon to University of Oregon students, Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art personnel and guests. Myrna Baez was born in San Juan in 1931 and died in 2018, shortly after her 87th birthday. To get acquainted with her importance in our visual arts, we must place her within a context, mid 20th century Puerto Rico. The island, one of the greater Antilles on the Caribbean, was invaded by the United States during the Spanish-American War of 1898. And from then on, it acquired the territorial status with diverse degrees of self-government if they agree with the laws issued by the American Congress. The 50s in Puerto Rico were the buoyant post-war years and the declaration of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico as the official status, a new name with autonomic aspirations for the colonial regime. Operation Bootstrap was the program designed to launch the industrialization of Puerto Rico 
as the means to economic development of the impoverished island. The benefits and tax exemptions enticed the inversion of American manufacturing industries and the ensuing creation of jobs that along with available federal funding of social projects produced the growth of the professional middle class and the improvement of life standards of a segment of the population. In exchange, the island increased political subordination and pawned its future with economic dependence on American capital and federal funds. We should go to the first uh, two slides before, the images before this ones, the one before. Okay, the second, the next one. Okay, this was Puerto Rico when Mirna Baez returned in 1957. After six years in Madrid, where she combined art studies at the Real Academia de San Fernando with the grand tour of Europe, that educational ritual of upper and upper middle classes with the purpose of acquiring direct knowledge of the cultural richness of Occidental history and art. The combination of studies and travel with required visits to galleries and museums will be constant in her life. Exposure to a variety of artistic expressions developed her critical view of the visual arts that served well with her artwork and as art professor. The next slide. She began giving art classes in her home and in the public education system until 1963. She obtained a part-time position at the art department of Universidad del Sagrado Corazón, where she worked for the following 21 years. Teaching was not only a salary that enabled an artistic career where income is unreliable, but also a lifelong commitment with the development of young artists and the promotion of Puerto Rican fine arts. Despite this, bias, teaching was for bias, as for most artists, challenge in keeping a balance between the requirements of education and the concentration needed for doing art. But she always knew that her artistic career came first. Uninterrupted work in her workshop was the structure that supported and ordained her life. When sickness broke the routine, she found no comfort nor resignation. She died three years later. The construction of her space as an artist was an intense and extensive process of constant learning and experimentation of individual and collective exhibitions in Puerto Rico and abroad, and of participation in national and international competitions and biennials. At her workshop, she alternated periods where she primarily painted with those in which she explored all the techniques of printmaking except digital prints which became popular after the 90s. After 1993 until 2015, Mirna Baez was devoted exclusively to painting. La Nube, Pausa, Noche de Luna, and Hombre ante el Paisaje belong to the last period she did graphic prints. Let's make a digression for a short explanation of printmaking. A print is an original artwork, printed generally on paper. Traditionally, artists prepare a matrix that is inked and printed multiple times to make an addition. If you notice, on the bottom of the printed image, you can find the number of prints in the addition. For example, 65 over 75 means that this print is 65, number 65 of 75 prints. On this show, bias prints are woodcuts and sales prints or a combination of both techniques. In relief or block prints, 
the artist transfers the reverse of the drawing to the block of wood, linoleum, or plexiglass, and then proceeds to carve the white areas of the drawing, leaving in relief the lines that are to be printed. The relief of the block is inked and printed one by one to make each print of the numbered edition. Relief prints on wood are woodcuts, on linoleum lane cuts, on plexiglass relief on plexiglass. Cell screen is the technique, the next, is a technique based on printing a matrix prepared with a stencil. The name derives from its origins when the screen was made of silk. While there are several ways of doing the stencil on the screen, this is painting with lacquer, which produces softer organic outlines, which buys herself preferred instead of the hard edges of stencils cut on film. The printer pushes the ink through the screen directly to the paper with a squeegee. The ink cover all areas not blocked by the stencil. Upon her return, Mirna Weiss attended for five years the graphic workshop of the Instituto de Cultura Puerto Ricana, Institute of Puerto Rican Culture, under the direction of master printmaker Lorenzo Omar, to learn printmaking techniques that she got to know superficially during her studies in Madrid. At the workshop, the young artist beginning a career had the opportunity of doing relief prints and seal screen with some of the main Puerto Rican artists of the 50s and to get acquainted with other artists and intellectuals that visited Master Omar, among them artist Jose Antonio Torres Martino, her friend and accomplice of many artistic projects and cultural battles, and the model in Pausa. Within the first couple of years at the workshop, Baez did a Junca series, four reliefs based on our national rainforest, one of them included under the nation. The Puerto Rican landscape depicted was no invention, but the product of direct observation during her outings through different parts of the island with photographic camera on hand. Throughout her career, Mirna Weiss used photography in various ways. First, as a reference to be included in a future composition, Weiss kept in her workshop a small file of the images, such as a landscape or the body of a model, or a lamp, or a chair, in fact, of forms that appealed to her and to which she would draw on when making a composition. For example, a Junque numero tres and Hombre ante el paisaje. Also, photography was the subject of a series of paintings about photography and photographic negatives, rendered in a painterly way, as in La Espera and Positivo y Negativo. Lastly, Weiss used photography as a reproduction of an object to be included in a composition through photosil screening. This procedure uses a screen prepared with a photosensitive emulsion. On top of the prepared screen is placed a photocopy in transparent paper of the image or drawing in black. The screen with the image is exposed over a light box, which transfers the image to the screen. Then it is printed as any other cell screen. For example, La Nube, Pausa, and Noche de Luna. In an interview about printmaking techniques, Baez declared that she continued using photosil screening to achieve atmospheric texture. In La Nube, Baez combines cell screen and woodcut. The trees and the huge cloud were photosil screened, which allowed her to create the light airy shape of the cloud and the meticulous work of the trees with every little branch. 
the contrast between the delicate forms of the trees and the hard contours that surround it in a lighter shade makes them look like cutouts placed on top of the landscape, a design solution to highlight the forms of the trees to balance the otherwise heavy form of the crowd, cloud. In Midnas Valle's creative process, the trees and the clouds are forms in an image. For this purpose, she drew upon mountains, a tree, the body of her models, mostly family, friends, and models from art classes, even her pets. The assembly of objects included those in her surroundings, like a flower vase or a lamp. In the documentary about her work, Los Espejos del Silencio, Mirrors of Silence, she expressed that the lighting of a lamp or the intense light spilling through a window brought other forms like stripes or triangles, adding complexity to the composition. The sharp contrast between the blinding light of the exterior and the interior shrouded in shadows, seen in many of her artworks, echoes the harsh light from the tropics. We want to stress that Baez never placed a form in a composition to symbolize something else. As she voiced many times, she did not make novels. She left that task to the art historian, the critic, or the viewer. In her work, she explored the relationship between forms and color in the pictorial space. And for that purpose, she used landscape and figures from her surroundings. However, this does not call into question diverse interpretations of her art for the sole reason that the viewer completes the process of making art and their perceptions are added meanings to the artist's intentions. In Los Espejos del Silencio, Jose Antonio Torres Martino traced the repeated presence of Puerto Rican landscape in Mirna Valle's work to her political compromise of affirmation of her national identity. According to Torres Martino, her political compromise had two trends, one visible in Puerto Rican life through her support of different social and political causes, the other one invisible, where the artist built with the representation of Puerto Rican landscape, a vision of the country that I quote, you do not notice immediately, but otherwise slowly permeates the viewer until it creates a sense of national pride. The visible trend of her political compromise that led her to support the independence of her country, along with diverse social causes, was because Puerto Rican artists had to solve many problems before they could focus exclusively on being artists, as she expressed in another interview. She firmly believed that affirmation of Puerto Rican identity was a constant struggle for the artist. And she thought that the questioning was due in certain to confusion in certain places about Puerto Rico, whether it was a country or just a group of people. The artist believed that questioning her Puerto Rican identity was to doubt her being. The importance of Mirna Valles in the history of Puerto Rican art of the 20th century lies in the production of a body of work that reflected constant creative surge that was not daunted by the demands of the art market taste. Even less by being a woman in a domain ruled mostly by males. Interviewed for her retrospective exhibition of 1982, Bias remarked that the reaction of women of different ages to her artwork was to tell her how proud they felt because, I quote, they saw a woman who worked seriously and was successful in a man's world. Even though more women than men graduate from art concentrations, male artists' work predominates 
in galleries and museums. Mina Weiss, with her example, raised awareness in the following generations of women artists of the professional conduct required for an artistic career. She built her own with the same patience and thoroughness she devoted to a painting, and her work gained prizes and acknowledgments in Puerto Rico and abroad. In 1988, Baez was appointed resident artist of the Universidad del Sagrado Corazón. This meant that she would not have to interrupt work in her workshop to give classes to earn a wage. Nevertheless, she warned years before that Puerto Rico had too many problems to devote yourself solely to painting. She arranged cycles of conferences about art appreciation at the Universidad de Sagrado Corazón, as well as she, as she continued the production of cultural projects with the Hermandad de Artistas Gráficos de Puerto Rico, Brotherhood of Graphic Artists of Puerto Rico, founded by Torres Martino and Baez at the beginning of the 80s, the Hermandad organized art exhibitions, a book and a documentary, among other projects, to record the art and achievements of Puerto Rican artists for future generations that did not know their history. At the same time, Baez kept her busy agenda of individual exhibitions until the end of the century. The year 2001 culminated with the honorary doctorate in art from the Universidad del Sagrado Corazón, the release of a monographic book about her work, and the opening of a retrospective exhibition of painting at the Museo de Arte de Puerto Rico. In 2015, with her health seriously impaired, her art dealer, Ot Tukela, coordinated the publication of a modest catalog of paintings done between 2001 and 2015. The last page has a list of 34 paintings, representations of landscapes or objects of the landscape or of her surroundings, an authentic procession of trees, mountains, clouds, sunny days, sunsets and nights, the figures of some friends usually seen from the back regarding the landscape, or even her pets peeping in a composition, as well as objects and furniture of her own home. It is a display of the forms she worked obsessively during her life. With the gaze of present time, it looks like a farewell parade her particular manner of fixing in our memory the joy of being a Puerto Rican artist. It is the image of Mirna Vais that we retain, the one that did not stop with the interruption of her life. It is her suspended time. Thank you. Thank you, Desi, for your insightful exploration of Mirna's work, her technique, the context, the historic and sociopolitical context in which she worked and also her commitment to Puerto Rican identity. Yes. It's my pleasure now to introduce Norma Vila Rivero. She was born in Puerto Rico and lives in San Juan. She's an interdisciplinary artist, exhibition coordinator and cultural manager. If you go to Puerto Rico, your first stop should be La Galeria at La Universidad de Sagrado Corazón to see what's on exhibit and to talk to Norma about contemporary art in Puerto Rico. She received a BA in visual arts and an MA in arts administration. And her work has been presented in Argentina, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Mallorca, Mexico, Norway, Peru, Puerto Rico, Switzerland, St. Croix, and the United States. In 2017, she participated in the Occupy Museum's debt fair installation at the Whitney Biennial. And in 2020, she received a National Association of Latino Arts and Culture Artist Grant to continue her project, A Metaphor Against Oblivion. She's organized around 100 exhibitions um, 
art exhibitions in Puerto Rico. And when she needs to recharge her battery, she goes to the beach and to Iceland. Welcome, Norma. Welcome. Oh, wow. No, that's quite a welcoming, Cheryl. Thanks a lot for this invitation, for having that broad mind and scope into making possible this exhibition of two Puerto Rican women, two different generations. Um, I am still surprised with this invitation, um, especially because um, it just happens that it turns to be the 20th anniversary of the first time I formally met Mirna Baez and I work with her as the gallery assistant of her retrospective uh, in the Museum of Art of Puerto Rico. Once Cheryl invited me to, to present the new work I was doing in order to create this exhibition, uh, we got to talk and she was so, so surprised about this coincidence. Um, Mirna Baez was an East. Um, a mentor, uh, more than a colleague, is like the North <laughs> in, in, for us Puerto Rican women artists. But I just want to say, um, before I start talking very briefly and very, um, in a natural way regarding my practice, um, that I, I want to thank the museum and all the museum professionals that have helped us with this um, exhibition. Um, it's been a hard work because we were working while we were on lockdown. So it's, it's nice that the suspended time is almost over. And if everything is okay, let me know if everyone can see my slides. I just want to talk about my practice as an artist. Um, my approach to art comes from a diverse number of per perspectives and media, while I try to work with context, symbols, and associations that refer to conceptual and process art. I am very much motivated by very impactful themes. My aim is to subtly work with those um, subjects that surround me, often responding to social oriented themes around my circumstances as a Puerto Rican, living in, a, in one of the oldest colonies in the Caribbean. And for me, nature is something, landscape is very important. And that's why my work usually is a combination of disciplines, that try, I try to work inclusively, inclusively and socially. But if you can see this slide, I'm going to be presenting a selection of my works for the past 16 years through photography, interventions, installation or mixed media. I have tried to comment on social problems that get me, that concerns me. Uh, whether to criticize or comment on our condition as a colony, the, the role that religion has in wars, the condition of the immigrant, um, the economical uh, inequalities by, by gender also has been something I have been trying to, to comment on with my work and recently environmental sustainability in the face of the economic growth that we're seeing here in Puerto Rico. I analyze and I aesthetically try to approach those conflicts and resistance. For me, it is very important to make them relate to each other and to unite aesthetic with also the social commitment. Um, I. I have been working with landscape in these slides. You can see different um, ways to approach the subject matter regarding the visitor economy. This is works from the 
2009, 2008, and the photos with the loaf of bread covered with ants. I was trying to work with the invasion and loss of our fauna and flora. And these photos are back to 2007. So there you see that the landscape has been something that I have been working with. But currently, my work is offering a critical look at the transformation of Puerto Rico's environment. I am inspired by two themes, landscape and absence. Here you can see um, the project that I'm ongoing project that I'm working um, titled A Metaphor Against Oblivion. Um, this show was first presented in Chapel Hill University back in 2018. And then at the bottom photos, it also was exhibited in Puerto Rico, Publica, um, in alternative art space in San Juan, and then at the University of Mayagüez in the west coast of Puerto Rico. And my intention with this project is to convey a wake up call about the effects of economical growth on environmental sustainability and the island's inhabitants. Um, it's very simple. All I have been doing is working with a metaphor, the skin of memory. I believe that skin has a memory. Everyone knows that when you take off your watch or a ring, you know this, you have like a mark of, of that memory of the object that was you know, touching your skin. And the same happens with, with our mind. Everything that we have seen marks us. And many times when passing by some place, it is inevitable to remember that place as it used to be. And that happens a lot here in Puerto Rico. I hope everyone can visit Puerto Rico. It's beautiful, but it's chaotic. And you can always see how our landscape is, is impossible. The, I always feel that there's an impossibility in our landscape. We, all sense of the word landscape, environmental or, or natural, um, everything is impossible. <laughs> but what I want to talk more about is the absence that remains in our memory. Everything that we're losing continue to be in our mind. We pass by a place and we remember there, there were, used to be a forest there. And now there's this, this um, construction that is supposed to help a community, but then uh, one year has passed by and it's abandoned. So then there you see why I, I talk about the impossibility of landscape here in Puerto Rico. So I know many students are connected and hi to everyone. I just want to go by and talk about my process. It's not a science. Since I was talking about the metaphor of, of skin, this is how I make the photos. Um, this is my first idea. <laughs> I have to say, and I'm going to be eternally thankful to the, my friends, colleagues that were part of this project as, a mo as models. Um, the first idea was to use the sun because we live in an island, but it, that doesn't mean that it's going to rain. We have a very bipolar, weather and there you can see how the image really work out this was a draft this was a just a tryout photo but you, you can see the the essence in her back very subtle but then i remember something that mina Weiss told us a couple of years ago, in back in 2005, when she also contacted me to work on another exhibition that she had in here in Sagrado Corazon, um, she gathered us and she told us, don't surround yourself with idiots. <laughs> what she wanted to tell us is that one must be careful with whom one surrounds and that it is better to surround oneself with people who can teach us or who know more than us. 
So for that, I'm very grateful with that guy in the photo. That's the amazing director of photography and photographer, um, Hochi Melero. Um, when I was st starting this project, he, he told me like how to do things in a simple way. Like Norma, forget about the sun. That's a beautiful idea, but you need to do these photos and it's a very troublesome process. So let's simplify that with another element that can feel like the skin is, is there. So this is the results of the photo that I present you. The result was that it improved and also the photos were made more fast. Um, here you can see photos of the places in where I'm placing the models, where I'm working with memory. This was an area that really affect me. Um, I used to live in front of this beautiful site. There used to be uh, always a walkable, walkable area surrounded by many palm trees. But then, they decided in back in 2015 to make this multi-million dollar project, 30 million dollars as a fact, known as the Paseo Lineal de Puerta de Tierra. From, from the beginning, this project trampled over the nearby communities and was a waste of money. Before the first year, which is the photo that you are seeing, you can see that everything was damaged, rust, but now there you can see the the result of four years of the construction of that millionaire project. Um, and I just want you to see this because also as an artist, um, I'm talking to the students, an idea can grow and you can also expand and continue working on the same um, theme and do more actualizations of the circumstances of the problem. Um, since I was invited to, to be in this show, um, Sherry Hartop told me that she wanted to see my, my new series. I was working with doing six new photos thanks to Nalak, and I have to say thanks a lot Nalak for this grant. It helped me to continue growing this project. And, but then I just wanted to do also other photos of after me and Navais. And here, since we had this amazing screen printing in the new collection of the Jordan Schneider Museum, that, that print, the model is a friend and colleague, Sonia Fritz. Sonia Fritz is one of the most well-known Puerto Rican Mexican cinematographer here in Puerto Rico. And she was willing to help me out with this idea. I wanted to do a uh, actual um, update in a sense, what would be now the environment, the surroundings now. Um, the, the title of this photo is Sunny Day in Puerta de Tierra. And as you know, it's inspired, inspired by Moonlight Night of Minnawai. So this is the same model. And now you can see the chaos, the damage, how our landscape is being trampled and abandoned. And all that is behind this supposed to be economical development, growth, improvement. But then you see that no, it's not what we're seeing in our surroundings. Um, now I'm go going to show some photos of the locations or basically the absence, what is no longer there. And as you know, I'm working with that representation in the skin of memory. So what you see in the back of this model, that's my amazing brother, um, is Palomino Island, Palominito K. A K that used to be very famous, Pirates of the Caribbean was filmed there. Many videos also of very famous musicians like J-Lo were also made there. But now it's no longer there because of man-made um, decisions. 
So as you can see, there's this constant struggle regarding what's happening with our environment, with our surroundings. This is another photo from the first series I made. You can see that I do research regarding different kinds of interviews. And I have to say thank you to Margarita Fernandez Zavala. Margarita Fernandez Zavala also one of the persons behind the donation of Milna Valle's work. She told me about this memory. Every time she goes to El Morro, this is in San Juan, she still remembers the trees that used to be there and they were chopped down um, because that's what happened. Trees create um, um, fallen leaf and that's dirty, so let's chop <laughs> nature. So she used to be the director of the Escuela, School of, of Art, of Escuela de Artes Plásticas, an art school in front of that area. In that, that happened in 1989 and all the students for days were doing a protest defending the trees. They even um, tied them, them, themselves to the trees so they don't chop them. So I recall this memory of her and found the photo of how it used to be and transcribed that memory in the back of this model. Um, the same happened with our public transportation that we used to have and we no longer have, but we still have the, the names of the stops. Everyone, this is a very famous avenue in Puerto Rico, Ponce, Avenida Ponce de Leon, and if you're here, you're going to hear that, oh, let's meet us at that at the stop 23 or the Museum of Contemporary Art is at the stop 18, but is what, ha what the collective memory. The, there's no longer a, a, a tram. There's no longer a public service of quality like it used to be that we had in the 50s. The last time was in 1953. So there you can see the my research. And now I just want to, you guys to see uh, the making of, of how do I work the photos. And I will have to say thanks, Daniel, with this, the help. <laughs> this is a video of the making up of the new photos.
Thank you, Daniel, for that presentation. Now I'm going to continue. Um, as you see, we were doing in that making of the the photo about the observatory of Arecibo. Um, here you can see photos of of how that amazing and very innovative place used to be. The photo I did, the title is the Arecibo Observatory Collapse, an ignominous and end to interstellar dreams. The fall of Arecibo radio telescope is indicative of the global divide surrounding funding of science infrastructure and new technologies. Um, this US famed Arecibo Observatory survived all manner of threats since its construction in a bowl shaped natural sinkhole in the forest hills of Puerto Rico. It was constructed in 1963. It was one of the jewels of the economical development in Puerto Rico and also of seeing Puerto Rico as a, as a scientific hub. Um, but sadly, um, the downfall in December of 2020 was caused by years of financial financial struggles, a classic example of the tensions between facility maintenance and scientific progress. It is, it is very important for me, this photo, because in Latin America, infrastructures of projects are often tied to ideas of economically the economical development a pot, as a potential answer to solve a country's ills. In this context, to watch a prize facility literally crumble as the United States retracted its financial, financial involvement seems like nothing less than abandonment. And here, I, I want to show this photo that is part of the exhibition because sometimes the research of how a place used to be doesn't necessarily have to be a photograph. It can also be an artwork. That's the importance of art, how art documents. And that's if I can provide something with my work is that I want my work to be the, the evidence, a clear manifest um, example of of the representation of the absence that surround us here in Puerto Rico. And here I use the work of Mirna Baez to talk about a new event. Um, we have a rainforest, one of the biggest, I mean, I think the biggest rainforest part of the United States is El Junque in Puerto Rico. And since 2020, the entrance is now basically privatized. You have to log in and pay a fee to enter. You can see in the photo, it's a very complex, difficult shot. I know that it's hard to see the, the stencil of, of a junke woodcut of Kinawai, but the importance here was to find that we finally got the time to find that exact place that where she did the woodcut. And that's the main entrance of la, the waterfall, very famous waterfall, La Coca. And now, as you can see with the street cones, is very, um, there's, there's a control there regarding entrance. And now you have to pay a fee. That's more talking about our situation as a colony. We, we, can, we don't control or or resource, but there's more info in the booklet in the exhibition about that. And as a final slide, I want to talk about this, this image because as you can see, history, art, um, what we make with our, with our hands is something that remains and it serves as a certificate of presence. We don't have the or Taino community, our first um, found, 
habitants in Puerto Rico. They die because of the, all those struggles with colonization. And, but we still have these Taino symbols and they're there, they're present, they're talking to us. And that's why I decided to do this photo because it's, it's there. They're constantly telling us that they used to be here and they are communicating to us. And I wanted to represent that. So as a conclu conclusion, I just want to tell the students and all the colleagues that are here that with these photos, my main concern is what you are seeing in these images, um, how to document and do give a wake up call regarding how we are damaging our natural um, environment with unnecessary construction that turns out to be layer, as you can see in the photo below, a hazard to communities and how we must rescue our heritage, our memory, and how also this is supposed to, to be an economical development is sometimes not seeing the real necessity that we need. Here you can see the, the two photos on the upper side with the two, two guys, communities that are being um, displaced, um, trampled, there are disappearing communities of people of low income to build very, very high, con, 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 very costly um, apartments for rich people who are using Puerto Rico as a tax evasion place. Or as you can see with my dad, that's the community park where I used to play when, when I was a kid and now it's abandoned. There's no no slide, there's no swings as it used to be. So I think art can help us give a wake up call and also it can be done in a very poetic way. Thanks for everything. Thank you, Norma. Um, thanks for your engaging presentation about your practice and the memory of skin and absence. Um, and it was great to see um, early on in your presentation, the director of photography, Hochi Molero there next to you. Um, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art has um, a couple photographs by Hochi Molero in, in its collection. So if people would like to, um, ask some questions, just put them in the Q&A and um, we'll go through them. Um, we have a, <laughs> a little bit of time. Um, Desi, I, I wanted to maybe ask you if you wanna um, take a, a first question. I really admired that model um, that you and Mirna, um, Margarita Fernandez Avala, Teresa Brigante, Maduquel, and others established on, you know, many years of researching um, an artist's work, documentation, publishing a major monograph, um, organizing an exhibition, and then, um, of course, working on all the images, the copyright. Um, and donating works to institutions all across, you know, the United States and and in Puerto Rico and possibly other uh, countries. Um, what does the the future of say telling the history of art in Puerto Rico look like to you? Does it look like something similar to that, or or something different? I think. Uh... Uh, today's artists, they are working very uh, in different manners. Um, I feel very optimistic by what I've seen. Um, you, do you mean about the search for 
the affirmation of identity issues. Uh, there are some people that feel that that isn't necessary, but as far as Mirna thought and Martino thought and myself, as far as the political situation in Puerto Rico remains in a limbo, it is something fundamental. The search for identity, not the search, the affirmation of your Puerto Rican identity is a real uh, something that is, is always present. I don't know in future generations, I see some of them working very hard on that, but in different ways, in different media. And I really love what they are doing in digital media. Really great installations, photography. I mean, there's so many languages, artistic languages coming up. It's very, it's, it's an exciting time. I remember when we were documenting um, or cataloging, I should say, Mirna Bias's work. And of course, one of the, the stipulations is that her nationality is Puerto Rican. You know, yes. some institutions, they will say American, comma, born in Puerto Rico. But um, in this case, um, we have, yeah, cataloged artists from Puerto Rico as, as Puerto Rican. Yes, she never, she was very, very, all her work is donated because she left that in her will. That was something that she said that she wanted it to be donated, not sold, and to be donated to places where there is an interest in Caribbean or Latin American studies. The other thing that she was very, always very firm about was to always be, uh, sure to to tell that she was a puerto rican artist never confused with hispanic or even latina because she always felt that was an etiquette that they put for minorities in the united states within the united states and in puerto rico we are no minority we are the majority so she always identified herself as a puerto rican um, we have a question um, of someone who's interested in the relationship between artistic production um, and the reception of art by the audience and the construction of national identity. Um, either Norma or, or Desi, if you'd like to, to address that. about, I, I really do not understand the right. question. <laughs> the relationship between one's artistic production, um, the reception of the artwork by the audience, whether it's in Puerto Rico or maybe internationally, and the construction of, of national identity um, well, in Puerto Rico, yeah. if there's a relationship between those three things. Even if, if this is something very strange in Puerto Rico, because even people that do not support independence for Puerto Rico will be very enthusiastic with works that are an affirmation of the identity. For example, you will see very, very commonplace images like Pedro Alviso Campo, which was a leader of the independence movement, and Julia de Burgos, a national poet, and you will travel throughout the island and you will see different artists working on those two images. So yes, the affirmation of our national identity is received, well received among the public. I think as, uh, yes, yeah, it, is, it is not a, a theme that, that will bring rejection to you. Yeah, and, and that is constant. We as artists, especially in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of discussion. And, and this is, is part of uh, an amazing book about the Puerto Rican identity, uh, art identidad. And some people were like trying to reject um, that 
subject matter, but at the end, when you start to study their, their work, it's a constant. Here in Puerto Rico, no matter if we are, if Mila Valles was painting landscape, there's the Puerto Rican identity. Is there? That's a reaffirmation of of her, her origins, of her, of her land, of her surroundings and interests. And I think that's how us artists work. We are basically a filter of our emotions, um, preoccupations, and that sense of who we are, where we going is constant. Especially in in the context of the country that we live in. Yeah. We have another question about how does self-portraiture fit into um, your practice, Norma, um, if at all? And also, did Mirna um, Bias make self-portraits as a way of affirming her Puerto Rican identity? Norma? OK, so can you say the, that? The, question again um, oh yeah does um self-portraiture um fit into your practice oh well you know i have been working with self-portraiture but i don't show that <laughs> i i try to to be in the other area when i do my my work who knows maybe i'm going to be one of the models in this series that could happen but but no, or, um, I don't see myself as being necessarily having to be there in the photo to talk about something that concerns me and that I identify. I think I I love empathy, <laughs> and I think that we we when we are empathic to situations with with um, in just in social injustice. We are reflecting ourselves there. We don't necessarily have to be there in the photo. We, we we are showing our true concerns and how we who we are. And Mirna Baez, about Mirna Baez, yes, she she did self portraits from the beginning of her career until almost the end. There is a, I think one of her last self portraits is I think yes. El Marco, which was donated to the National Portrait Gallery um, recently. That was one of the donations. And she, you see the artist, her self-portrait uh, as a painter. I'm so fascinated by Mirna's use of um, like um, portals or these gateways, something to kind of transcend you know, <laughs> boundaries or limitations, also the mirror. So when I'm thinking of that self-portrait, um, there's the frame, but it also becomes like a mirror to the object. Um, I don't know, Desi, if, or even Norma, because you both knew Myrna quite well, um, if she talked about, um, you know, why she incorporated these kinds of um thresholds you know or you know reflective um elements in her work i think that is part of making uh, the contrast between light and shadow uh between the light in the exterior and the, and the interior shrouded in shadows uh, that reflects the tropics that was a concept with her and also the, the landscape it goes through the walls. So many times to, to make the point, you can see the, a door or window and you see in the outside the light, the blinding light, while the interior is like almost in shadows. So it's, it's, it's like a mirror of Puerto Rico because you know, not right now you're in Ponce. And you go at the mid in, in the 12 o'clock outside and it's blinding. And then you go inside and it almost looks like, I mean, cozy. Yeah. Uh, it has to do with that. 
But she, what she will inter, I think the interest at her most was light and shadow, uh, color and form. That were that were the things she she worked with. Um, I just want to say that that's true what Desi mentioned. But I just saw that we have um, Jose David Miranda in the chat. Um, as uh, one of the participants, and he also got to know very well Milna Baez. If he wants to also answer, I don't know, via the chat, that question regarding why Milna Baez um, worked with that double mirror of landscape and indoors, that would be amazing. Also, hi to Tony Hamilton, Jose Ortiz, Annabelle, amazing artists, colleagues. Aww. That's great. And um, Norma, are you going to continue with the Metaphor Against Oblivion series? Um, or have you started a new project or a new series of work? Thanks for that question. Um, I think this is going to be an ongoing project, but definitely it's not going to be the only project I, um, I plan to, to be working. Right now, the photo I have as a background is is um, a graphic in design intervention on a photo of a landscape that is very in the process of being demolished because they all of a sudden want to build a casino in front of the beach in the West Coast. Um, it's been a struggle, a fight for the last six, seven years to avoid that in an area that there's no need to have an hotel and a casino. Also with the name of Christopher Columbus, which he didn't discover as he was uh, an oppressor and an, an assassin. So um, I'm, I, I'm feeling the need to work more with my hands. No, although as you saw in the video, I do stencils and I, it's a process. It's, it's not only the photo on the side, also, the selection of the models is very pertinent, and the model has to have a connection, a history with that place. But I think I need to do more materic work. Um, I have many ideas now, more with psychon fence and <laughs> banners and ceramic. Let's see what happens. I need a studio. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, a question here. Um, Norma, did Mirna Baez, did she see or know about um, the Metaphor Against Oblivion series? No, she didn't. She, Mirna Baez died in 2018, right? This, yeah. 2018. And uh, the last time I saw Mirna Baez, unfortunately, was back in 2016. I I had the opportunity to to take care of her for two or three months, spend the nights there. Um, but she didn't saw this this project. Um, also, I to tell you the truth, I never saw the connection between my work and Mirna Baez until you proposed it. And now I see a lot, and I think it's part of that collective memory, you know? And when you surround yourself with people who know more than you and you you follow through, right? Um, I The same concerns regarding what's happening with our landscape, I have that same concerns and it's not a science what I'm doing. It's just, I am transcribing that, um, worries that I have um, in a different way. But thanks to curators like you, you see the, the connections and you put together all these projects. That's the magic of the curators. <laughs> that third eye. Well, I'm so pleased that the gift to the collection generated this connection also with your work and, and that you know, um, it could be shared with the students and faculty and, and the public um, in the Northwest where so many of these um, themes are also very prescient. They're very 
um, present. So I want to thank Desi and, and Norma for your important work and your time and, and thoughts today. Um, students, faculty, audience, for your participation and joining us. Um, thank you, Danielle, for organizing this program, and I'm going to turn it back to you. Oh, thank you all so much for sharing your stories and the art with us today. I appreciate that. It's been really a pleasure to be in the gallery taking groups through uh, faculty and students and audience members while the work has been on view. And that's just been really a pleasure to see how these connections in person in the gallery with the artwork manifest um, but what our viewers see in the work and all the exciting things we can point out that you mentioned in this talk about appreciating the materials and the scale and the thought that went into uh, these compositions. And so um, I just want to say thank you for being with us today to do this. And thank you, Cheryl, for um, leading this conversation. And um, as I mentioned, the show will be on view for a little longer than a month now. So anyone who has the opportunity to see it in person, um, I hope you'll be able to take advantage of that. And um, we hope to, to stay in touch and hear what comes next for all of you.